This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. And today in studio, we have Paul Bellamy. And Paul is a graduate student. He's finishing up his last semester in, as a Master of Public Health in the Department of Public Health at the University of Kentucky. And it's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about all things ticks. Um, <laughs> before we get started about talking about your research with ticks, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do at UK as a graduate student. Well, I uh, my background is I have an undergraduate degree from in entomology from uh, the University of Kentucky here. And after I finished that just a couple years ago, I'm uh, currently, like you said, as an MPH student at the University of Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Most of my background there is dealing with the environmental side of things, so environmental health and occupational health. Um, that's been most of my education there. And it kind of got me into the research with, uh, with ticks, again, mm-hmm. from my undergraduate degree. Okay. So what first got you interested in entomology? I would say I've always been interested in Bugs, Bugs, insects, okay. spiders, uh-huh. and all that. Uh, it's been something I've been interested in since I was a kid. And okay. uh, moving forward, I got into the healthcare stuff. I really enjoyed working in that capacity. And so mm-hmm. moving on from that, um, going in, getting my undergraduate degree in entomology, I really got to get some hands on experience. Right. And uh, then in public health, it kind of brought both of those together, looking at kind of disease and you know, vectors are really important. And especially here in the U.S., ticks are a big part of that, and they have a way higher burden of disease than other insects here in the U.S. So it kind of, the interest kind of came to my, uh, my education, kind of blossomed that way. Okay, great. That's good. I guess we'll jump into the topic about ticks. Tell us a little bit about the insect themselves. They, uh, they're not an insect. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, there we go. Uh, there we go. Yeah. But, uh, Learning but, already. <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, ticks are more associated with uh, spiders, if you will. Okay. Um, they're um, more with mites and stuff like that. But, uh, but ticks by themselves are a, a huge problem here in the U.S. They're very um, underrated, if you will, as far as the amount of disease burden they carry, especially when you compare them to things like mosquitoes, where we do get more of that, like, that outbreak worry. We get more of the, the nuisance problems. So while some people might experience tick nuisance, it's generally one of those things that when you're out hiking, you get them, and people just don't pay as much of attention to them as they would, like a mosquito bite. So tell us when um, ticks go through their life cycle and, and what they do, kind of when they're most prevalent out in the woods and things like that. And when that. they become a problem for us. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the ticks we have here are three host ticks. So that means that they have to feed um, three times. You know, when they become a larva, they have to feed and then they go into their next life cycle, the nymph stage, mm-hmm. and then they feed again and they become an adult and then they'll feed again before they they mate and lay their eggs. A lot of times we'll get like the nymphal stage and stuff like that in like the spring and fall. Those are the type of areas you're going to find the most ticks out biting. Those are the areas we're also more worried about transmitting diseases Mm -hmm. because they've already fed before and they're more likely to be carrying those diseases. Okay. So do you have any interesting facts about ticks that we may or may not want to know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Ticks, um, well, I guess, you know, with winters, um, you know, if there's a lot of snow, a lot of people assume that it's just the cold, but if uh, there's a lot of snow on the ground, that's an insulation and they can actually use that and uh, help, you know, protect themselves over winter, if you will. Yeah. So it doesn't uh, kill, cold doesn't kill them. No, cold, okay. cold does not kill them just by themselves, unless it's cold for a certain amount of time. But that, mm-hmm. that, that snow is helping insulate them from that cold. Okay. So it uh, helps protect them that way. Okay, so what kind of ticks do we have in Kentucky then? The three main ticks that we generally look at here in Kentucky are the um, black-legged tick. Um, we look at the Lone Star tick. And then we look at the American dog tick. And we do have like a winter tick and stuff like that here. But uh, those are the three main ones that we uh, are aware of and that are more widespread here in Kentucky. Okay. I know sometimes when our foresters are out, they'll talk about the little seed ticks. Yes. Where do they fall? Where's that fall? <laughs> well, the, the, the seed ticks, generally what most people are talking about is they're talking about that first stage of the life cycle oh, okay. in, in ticks. And usually when you go out there and you find those, they look like little tiny pinpricks. They're very, very, very small. And usually you will find 
hundreds of them at once. It's mm-hmm. you're walking through a field and you get blanketed with these seed ticks. Mm-hmm. And that's just the larval stage of a uh, tick's life cycle. That's what that is. Okay. And those still carry diseases you said they Generally, or? no. Generally, oh, okay. those okay. are not going to be carrying okay. um, a lot of like Lyme disease and stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. not, um, okay. those aren't as worried. And those show up in the spring, you said, or when do those? Uh, little, those little will tiny generally be more or? during the the summer. What can you do to protect yourself from ticks? If you're, I mean, a lot of our profession, that's what they, they're out in the woods all the time. And so, how can they protect themselves, or how can you protect your animals as well? There's a lot of um, products that the CDC recommends. The the main one that's recommended is DEET. Um, Mm -hmm. You can have some DEET that you can spray on. Um, Other things like uh, permethrin treatments for clothing Mm -hmm. is uh, is good as well. Um, Wearing light colored clothing is very important because it helps you see the ticks earlier on, you know, before they can get into a spot where they attach to themselves Mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Tucking your pants into your boots, uh, putting some tape around the bottom of your boots and stuff like that is really a good idea as well. It helps keep them from getting up under your pant leg to begin with. Checking yourself regularly is also really important and uh, I can't underestimate the importance of when you get home Mm -hmm. because ticks that might have lashed themselves onto you while you're out in the field or something like that is uh, really important for when you get back home putting your clothes either in like the washer for a full um, washing cycle or putting your clothes into a dryer for like about a 15, you know, 10, 15 minute heat cycle will generally kill them as well. But a lot of times people will bring those back. They'll just put their clothes in a hamper and you can still end up with ticks inside of that, uh, inside of that hamper. So Mm -hmm. doing that, taking a shower when you get home is really good. You you know, gives you a good thorough check over and make sure there's no ticks that are Mm chills trying to come home with you. Okay. So if you do get one, how do you get it off of you? I mean, what's the best way? You know, I've heard... they're attached. <laughs> There's a lot of myths <laughs> out there. I've heard a hundred different ways to remove a tick. Uh, matches, you know, gasoline. I mean, people Tweezers, use a lot of different yeah. things. And it's uh, it's really important to not do <laughs> most of those things. The, uh-huh. the only real way that you're supposed to remove it is supposed to take some fine point tweezers, get as close to the skin as possible, grab it, and pull straight out. Mm-hmm. And that is what you're supposed to do. Using a lot of the other tactics that irritate or leave the tick in longer, such as trying to suffocate it out, is generally not a good idea. Because for one, you're leaving the tick in longer, or you're irritating it, which can cause the tick to produce more saliva and can cause it to push more of whatever possible pathogen is inside of it in your body quicker. Mm -hmm. So you're wanting to make sure that you take that out as quickly as possible Mm -hmm. and as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned for us, what about our animals, dogs? You can't really spray them with DEET. (laughs) No, a lot of times you you do have collars that you can wear for the dogs and that does help. And making sure that when your animals are coming in or out from the uh, the forested areas or the fields or something, you're checking them to make sure they're not bringing ticks back home with them as well. A lot of times ticks will hide behind the ears or um, around people like waistbands and stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know, so it's a good idea to check those areas specifically. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the research that you're working on um, with ticks. Uh, the research I'm working on is focusing on something called alpha gall syndrome. It's also known as the red meat allergy more more commonly. Mm-hmm. Um, this research I am doing is primarily focusing on forestry workers here in the state of Kentucky, and even more specifically, most of them are loggers. And uh, my research is looking at whether or not we have this alpha gall syndrome here and whether or not it's a problem or even more so potentially an occupational health hazard. Mm-hmm. Um, So what I've been doing is I've been taking surveys and blood samples from different forestry workers within Kentucky, and I'm working with uh, Dr. Scott Commons at UNC Chapel Hill, who's doing some of the blood analysis and helping me with the um, the analysis for the IgE-specific antibodies, which are specific antibodies in our body that are more associated with allergies. And so this IgE, we're measuring it and seeing what kind of levels we get and see if someone's become what we call sensitized to Mm alpha-gol, which Mm -hmm. is a carbohydrate found in all red meat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that includes pork, beef, venison, lamb. All of these things have alpha-gol in the meat. And so when people become sensitized to this, they have a potential to become allergic to those products that contain this alpha gall in them. What we're looking at is to see whether or not people are becoming sensitized to it, and then I'm pairing it up and seeing if they're also developing symptomology. Mm -hmm. Um, Because just because someone becomes sensitized doesn't Mm -hmm. always mean they're experiencing clinical symptoms. It doesn't mean that they're having those types of issues. So it's really important to understand both of those sides of things. And so what do people need to look out for if they have been bit by a tick and think they might have kind of the allergy to the red meat? 
Well, it doesn't act like a lot of other allergies do. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times tick carry multiple pathogens at once. So obviously if you're uh, you're getting rashes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that would be something you'd want to get looked at after you're, you've um, been exposed to a tick for a long time. However, with the alcohol allergy, there might not be any good indicators previously before you start having okay. allergy-like issues. So a lot of the time you could be eating, I don't know, um, for dinner or for lunch, you could be eating something with meat in it. Mm -hmm. And then it could be, you know, four, six hours later that you actually start to develop um, a reaction to that. So it's really unique in that way to where you're having a very lengthened amount of time before you start to experience allergy-like symptoms from the consumption of um, that allergen. Okay. How um, long prior to your tick bite would you notice that interaction? Would it be like the day before or a month before? Or is it, how long does it take to develop that problem? We are not sure. There's okay. a lot about this issue that we are not sure about. We don't know why certain people develop this allergy and mm -hmm. other, others don't. We don't okay. know if it takes one tick bite or if right. it takes five yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. if it needs to be on you for a certain amount of time. Um, just the main hypothesis right now, the main theory is that people are being exposed through the tick saliva and then from them feeding on a different animal and then feeding on us. Mm -hmm. And so then they're putting that, that carbohydrate, the alpha gall that they picked up from the animal and that saliva is being pushed back into our system. And where we don't, you know, make that, mm -hmm. we, uh, we're concerned that that is what's causing us to be sensitized. So that's really a large amount of the extent of what we know about this um, as far as, you know, what we can hypothesize and things like that. Okay. And and you mentioned it was um, earlier before we started the show that it's an, kind of a new thing. So you guys are a relatively recent issue that you guys have been working on. When did, when did you guys start seeing this in the public? I think it was 2000... 2008 that uh, Dr. Scott Common started making some connections here okay. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. as far as where this alpha gall allergy could be coming from um, and associating that with ticks. Okay. Uh, we have most of the issue along the East Coast, along mm -hmm. the east side of the United States, but this is also an issue in um, Australia. You know, they're having issues over there. They're having issues in Germany and their forestry and logging population as well okay. there. So this is relatively new, I think, from about then to now. We've been mm -hmm. seeing a couple cases. It's been coming more aware. And, you know, with more awareness comes more cases being diagnosed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people are actually starting to look for it now. But we've had, I guess, theories about it for a little mm -hmm. while now mm -hmm. as to why this allergy could be a thing. Because there was um, a series of case reports that were done a while back, at the, um, right before the turn of the century, that were indicating potential oddities in people oh, developing mm -hmm. allergies to meats. Right. And so it's just become more of a thing where we've known about the tick side of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the symptoms that people have when they start feeling this way and knowing that they can't maybe can't eat red meat? Well, where I had talked about before about the lengthened amount of time that can be um, experienced before people actually develop symptomology, mm -hmm. it's sometimes people are eating dinner and then going to bed and waking up at night and having um, gastrointestinal illness, you know, mm -hmm. diarrhea, stomach cramping, um, those types of issues. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people don't even associate it with being red meat. They just think they ate something bad or, you know, right. something like that. Potentially, or I mean, especially if they're not very frequent meat eaters. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the symptomology is traditional as far as um, foodborne allergies and stuff like that. They can experience all the way up into um, anaphylaxis. There's been some thoughts that what we call idiopathic anaphylaxis, which pretty much means you're having anaphylactic reaction, but they're really not quite sure what it is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of some research has been looking into whether or not that and some of those cases are actually being caused from an undiagnosed alpha gall red okay. meat allergy. Oh. Okay. Um, this isn't just a foodborne allergy, though. I feel like it's important to mention that um, this is also a medication allergy. Um, if certain things like uh, pro products like gelatin or something like that are used in the pr making of certain medications mm -hmm. or a medication that has a high amount of that alpha gall still cause reactions. That's uh, one of the ways this was actually initially looked at mm -hmm. was from a, a medication that, um, that was causing allergic reactions in the population okay. on the eastern mm -hmm. side of the United States. Another interesting fact is that this is not just 
a medication or a meat allergy. This is also an issue with um, heart valve transplants, something you wouldn't normally think about, but a lot of times when we do heart valve transplants, mm -hmm. we can use either porcine or bovine heart transplants. So this will be from pork or a beef source. Oh, okay. And, now I'm making the connection. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and those uh, those types of heart valves are going to have that alpha gal in them. And uh -huh. so when you do to go to, to go to the transplant, there's been a couple case studies that have been looking into potential side effects or other things that have to be done to um, counteract those types of issues when doing those types of transplants. So there's no medicine that helps with this, though, is there? Or does it is the, are there medicine that reduces symptoms or is it just kind of... Not that I'm aware of. If you of. have it, you have it. It's yeah. one of those things, if you have it, you have it. The main mm -hmm. recommendation that's um, right now is just to avoid the, the red meat. So Wow, um, that would be hard. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. I'm an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at University of Kentucky. I'm here to teach you a little bit about the animals that live in our forests, especially those here in Kentucky. For those of you who might just be joining us, each week we'll play a wildlife sound from our forest. Here's our sound for this week. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we'll talk about this animal and why it is making that sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. If you do get bit by a tick, how do you know which tick you got bit by? I mean, is there a way to tell? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question because a lot of times people aren't thinking about that when they're pulling a tick off their body. Right, but, they're just trying to get it off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the main tick that's associated with this um, here on the eastern side of the United States is the Lone Star Tick. And the females have a white spot on their back. Okay. And uh, that's a really good tail Indicator. sign that mm -hmm. that is in a lone star tick mm -hmm. okay and what are the you said there was three pretty much yeah, three, three in kentucky what are the other the, two? the black legged tick and then the american dog tick mm -hmm. and the black legged tick has black legs and <laughs> <laughs> that's original <laughs> and the uh yeah the the dog tick is generally brown and uh, it's pretty uniform okay so and what are some of the other um health issues like lyme disease or things like that are there other things besides the alpha gall Yes, yes, there are. Um, with the Lone Star Tick in particular, you've got things like ehrlichiosis, um, that is a bacterial disease that is a, an issue we do have to worry about here in Kentucky. Um, more recently, with the uh, where we've been seeing, I guess, a higher number of black legged ticks mm -hmm. here in Kentucky, Lyme's disease is an issue and we mm -hmm. something we have to worry about. Okay. And then we have Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever with like the American dog tick and stuff like that that um, can be transmitted. Okay. Do you have any idea as to why we're seeing more ticks? I know when I was a kid, I walked through the mountains all the time and never had any ticks on me. And now you just look at it and you get a tick on you. So, I mean, is it climate or is it, do you have any idea in your research on why ticks have become numerous, I guess? <laughs> my, my thoughts on the matter is that a lot of the movement um, with deer populations and stuff like that mm -hmm. and uh, other wild animals is what drives a lot of that change in uh, tick populations as well as the climate does play a part. But I think a lot of the time it's more along the lines of populations of animals mm -hmm. and uh, the spread and movement of those because a lot of you know different stages of tick will feed on like different sized animals mm -hmm. where a lot of the younger ticks will feed on things like mice and stuff like that. Some of the, uh, like the adult tick will feed on like deer and like possums or something like that. So Are there any animals they won't feed on? They won't feed on? Well, I did say possums, but possums, <laughs> you know, are known to eat some of those ticks. They're pretty good at cleaning themselves off. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. My recommendation, if you get bit and you're worried about it um, because the tick has either been attached for a long time or you're just concerned, is a lot of times what you can do is you can take the tick, you can put it in a bag, put it in the freezer, and then wait for a few weeks or something like that. And then you can take the tick back out if you need to, if you start developing like 
rashes or if you start developing symptomology that you're concerned potentially came from a tick-borne disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one thing we failed to address is how do they get on you in the first place? Well, it's kind of funny if you ever look at any videos, the ticks um, a lot of the time will be like on the end of grass blades or they'll be on the end of like twigs or something or about the level of which they think they'll find their host. Mm -hmm. And they kind of wave their arms in the air and they, when they uh, sense someone coming, whether or not that be uh, CO2 production, which mm -hmm. is, you know, when we breathe out, we're producing that. And they have um, receptors on them that are kind of sensing those types of chemicals in the air mm -hmm. and uh, vibrations and uh, stuff like that. They'll mm -hmm. use to kind of detect when something's getting close and then they'll grab on as soon as they uh, get close enough, so. Okay, that's interesting. So where can people go for um, more information on the ticks? Um, UK has a, a good site that's been put together by the entomology department okay. that kind of explains some of the tick issues and um, some of the um, diseases that we uh, are looking for here. Mm -hmm. um, the CDC also has a very good, well put together website talking about the different life cycles, um, about certain um, chemicals that you can use to help protect yourself from insecticides. Um, and different methodologies you can use to uh, keep yourself safe while you're outside mm -hmm. outdoors so you can continue to enjoy the outdoors right. without worrying about getting bitten by a bunch of ticks. Right. Well, you've presented us with a lot of great information, and we greatly appreciate you coming in today. Um, is there like one or two takeaway items that you'd like to leave our listeners with on possibly something about ticks <laughs> that they might uh, it might be helpful for them to know? Um, I would just leave with the advice that while... Tick-borne illness does seem to be a, a rarity. It is something that does happen, mm -hmm. and we do have probably a lot more cases than what is actually being presented. Right. So I think it's always important to just be vigilant, be aware, and um, you can definitely still enjoy yourself while mm -hmm. keeping safe and making mm -hmm. sure you're not putting yourself at a potential risk for developing any of these horrible issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Paul, for joining us today. And if you would like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned now for another episode of Extension Notes. So now we are going to do a segment on Extension Notes. And uh, right now in, t in studio, we have Billy Thomas, and he's an Extension Forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And we appreciate you coming on today. Well, thank you all for having me. For those of you that are new listeners or haven't heard about our Extension Notes, this is just a brief segment on some of the current events or opportunities that Forestry Extension offers to the public. And today we're going to talk about a webinar we are going to be conducting on Thursday. So we brought Billy in here to tell us what that's all about. Sure. So we mentioned some of this in previous extension notes in mm -hmm. a previous episode. If um, For those listening to the podcast, um, right. go back and check out episode 18 because we've got a great episode there dealing with woodland owner resources and mm -hmm. all the resources that are available. And then I think we followed it up on um, episode 23. 23, I believe. Yeah, yes. dealing with the upcoming webinar series that we've been working on. The final episode is coming up, if you will, on um, March 21st, mm -hmm. and that's going to start at 7 o'clock p.m. And we've got it at a number of county extension offices. I think almost 30 offices across mm -hmm. Kentucky, county extension offices, are hosting this um, live offering. That's the only place it's available live. We will have recordings of it available later. So if you're listening to this after March 21st, um, you'll be able to check out our website at ukforestry.org and you'll be able to find links to the recordings of this website. But we've got this final one coming up. It's been part of a regional series that we've been doing with some of our sister extension units in other states. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working with Missouri and Tennessee Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia to put this series together. And it's really been a big hit. We've had a number of counties all across the state that have participated. Um, several hundred landowners from Kentucky have been part of this so far. And we're really excited about this one coming up on Thursday, March 21st, because it's all about Kentucky. It's all, all right. Kentucky specific. And we've got some great people coming in to talk about some of these programs and resources that are available for Kentucky woodland owners. Tell me, um, for those that might be interested in attending this, how can they find out which county it's being offered and, and where to go from there? Sure. You can visit our website, ukforestry.org, and it's one of our main little tabs running a little scroll bar across mm -hmm. the top there of pictures. And we've got a link there to the upcoming webinar series. And there you can see which counties are hosting this one. For listeners in central Kentucky, the two closest offices are the Scott County office in Georgetown and the Madison County office uh, in Richmond. So those are relatively close to your listeners. And we 
have them spread out throughout the region as well, but those are probably the closest to Fayette County mm-hmm. that are hosting there. So what they'll need to do, basically, they can just show up at those offices okay. at 7 o'clock, but the agents would like to know in advance, and there's, you can find out your agent's number and stuff off of our website as well and give them a call and let them know that you plan to attend. But um, there's no charge for them, and it's a great opportunity to not only hear about the programs and resources available to Kentucky Woodland owners, it's also a great networking opportunity mm-hmm. for landowners to meet other landowners that are dealing with similar issues. And, you know, oftentimes landowners learning from other landowners can be some of the more powerful learning that happens. So um, I encourage folks to get out and participate in this series. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions and interact with us live. Like I said, we've got folks coming from several different agencies that are going to be part of it as well. Okay, so we have the title Forestry and Wildlife Assistance in Kentucky. What exactly does that mean? You know, one of the things that I've always been blown away with in my pro- programming and my job here at UK is how many landowners are unaware of all the help and resources that are available to mm-hmm. them. So this program that we're going to be doing on March 21st is really intended to highlight those programs that work most closely with landowners, really geared toward forestry and wildlife practices, things that they can do on their property to enhance the value and productivity of their property from either maybe a timber standpoint or a non-timber standpoint with recreational opportunities or maybe you're interested in wildlife. Really whatever you want to do with your property, this webinar is going to be covering those organizations and how they can specifically help landowners. So we're going to be visiting with three different organizations in addition to us, UK Mm -hmm. Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. We're going to have on there with us the Kentucky Division of Forestry. We have a representative coming over and, and folks will be able to hear all the programs that they do, what they're about, and how to access those programs as well. Um, Similarly, we're going to have the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources on that webinar as well. We have an actual private lands biologist that's going to be presenting that. And the private lands biologist is really a wildlife biologist that works with private landowners on the management of their property to benefit wildlife. (laughs) Uh So um, they're going to be on there talking about the resources, information, and programming that they have available to help landowners. And then the final segment is going to be with the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in Kentucky, one of our main partners, and one of the resources that landowners can tap into regarding getting financial assistance to implement these practices. You know, sometimes there may be costs associated with doing practices. Certainly your time um, can be a cost, but there may be other costs associated as as well. So the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, Mm -hmm. is an entity that passes money through the federal government, through the Farm Bill, to landowners across the nation to do conservation-related practices. So you're going to learn about how to access those programs, what those programs are, the type of practices that they'll pay for, get a sense for how much it'll cover and all of that. So all in all, it's a great opportunity in a really relatively short amount of time for landowners to get to know the agencies that can help them directly with forestry and wildlife resources, um, understand what they're capable of doing, understand how they can access them, and also find some financial support to help you implement these practices on your property. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. I know you've said that they can go to several different counties, but tell our listeners maybe um, maybe some of them don't know what a webinar is. So explain to them what actually a webinar is. What what are they going to see or hear once they get to this county right. that they're going to? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure when the word webinar came into either, existence. You know? <laughs> but it really, it's a, it's a blend of two words, right? Yeah. A, a web, yeah. you know, internet, if uh-huh. you will, and then also seminar. Mm-hmm. So this is a webinar. webinar. So basically, <laughs> you can think of it, in essence, as a seminar over the, the internet. internet. <laughs> so the, the nice thing about the technology nowadays, it allows folks to interact with us in real time. So they can type in questions into a chat pod and ask us questions if they have. They'll also, we'll be on live video, so Mm -hmm. they'll be able to see us. And and then they'll also be able to see our presentations as they come across the screen as well. So it's really like you're attending a, a live seminar. You just happen to be doing it through the internet. And at 30 different counties at one time, which makes it nice. And that's really exciting. So we are so thankful for all of our county extension agent hosts out there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't really deliver this program without them. And they play such an important role in that. And, you know, I'm excited about working with the county extension agents as well and woodland owners because a lot of times woodland owners don't realize all the resources that are available to them locally through their county extension offices and the agents that work in those offices. So kind of a side thing benefit in my mind is Mm -hmm. that it may 
helps make those connections that may not already exist. So it's a great opportunity for our woodland owners not only to learn about forestry and wildlife resources that can help them on their property, but it's also a great opportunity for them to learn about local county extension offices, which we have one in every county mm-hmm. in Kentucky, all 120 of them. Even though they're not all participating, they're mm-hmm. still there and available to work and help with um, any issues that you might have, agriculture, natural resource related, even farm and family stuff, as mm-hmm. well as youth programming. So a lot of resources are available at our local county extension offices, and I hope this program helps facilitate that relationship. Yeah, that county agent could be a really a good asset for anybody they, who's trying to really, know about anything from canning to wildlife uh, and forestry. No doubt. The yeah. agents that we have in Kentucky are outstanding, and they are so helpful in their community, and they're really good. If they don't know the answer to something, they have a lot of resources that they can tap into, mm-hmm. and they can usually quickly find the person or the answer to almost any question that folks may right. have. So even if you're not listening for forestry and wildlife stuff, I encourage your listeners to get to know their local county extension offices. There's a lot of opportunities for people to get involved as well if they're interested. A lot of volunteer opportunities. And, you know, we have a lot of listeners that probably have a lot of skill sets that could be valuable. They may want to share with others. So mm-hmm. get involved. Get part of your local county extension office. I think it'll be a very rewarding experience um, for any of those people that yeah, are so inclined. A lot of county agents done a lot of different classes, everything from food preparation to a, we'll have forestry events. And yeah. I've even seen some with basket weaving. So, it, I mean, sure. it's a wide variety it of really information. Is. So it doesn't necessarily be you're not interested in forestry or wildlife. It exactly. could They could be doing other things as well. And it would be something that you would probably be beneficial for you to learn. Yeah, I, w- I would venture to say that there's probably something for everybody. everybody. <laughs> yes. You know, regardless of your interests um, right. that you can get some assistance with or get more information from your local county office. But again, I encourage your listeners to join us on March 21st. Um, If you're listening live right now, then March 21st, this coming Thursday, we're going to have this series. And you can find out more again at ukforestry.org. You can find links to the other hosting offices. And if you're listening to the podcast, again, you know, check it out um, on ukforestry.org. And we'll have links to the recordings of these podcasts, as well as a tremendous number of other resources um, that are available for woodland owners. So um, check it out. We'd love to have you all out there listening to us and uh, participating in the webinar that's coming up this Thursday. I know that you've mentioned it in some of our other um, podcasts and episodes, but um, for those maybe new listeners that we have, can you talk a little bit about the the woodland owners that we have in Kentucky and why it's so important to have them, you know, kind of working on their land and and learn about their land and and attend or um, do some events like this? Good question, Laura. Woodland owners are so important, not only here in Kentucky, but really throughout the eastern United States. The vast majority of our forested land in the eastern United States is privately owned. And it's largely privately owned by families and individuals that are woodland owners, if you will. And what they do on their property impacts us all. Mm-hmm. whether we realize it or not. And it, not only does it impact them locally, but, you know, our forest plays such an important role in wildlife diversity, um, ecosystem services, cleaning our air, cleaning our water, providing habitat. They just do so much for society overall. The supporting woodland owners to do good practices on their property benefits everybody. So attending these educational programming that we do at UK Forestry Extension is a great way for landowners to learn about what they can do and and who can help them do these things. Everything we promote and push has been research driven. Um, we're a neutral entity and we, it's all based on the research that we've done, not only here in Kentucky, throughout the region, but it's all intended really to help people get the most out of their property, um, either economically or for other purposes that they're trying to, objectives mm-hmm. that they got interested in. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a great opportunity to get a lot of information in a short amount of time and it can have long lasting impacts on that property. A great thing about forestry compared to traditional agriculture. Agriculture requires a lot of intensive time inputs frequently. Mm -hmm. Forestry, we can get in there at a few certain times during the life of that forest, and we can have a significant impact on the direction and the potential of that forest um, by doing a few practices at certain key times. So it's not something that you have to do like every day or Mm -hmm. every month, Um, but if you do it at the right times, you can have a big impact on that future forest and what it's capable of providing, not only to you as an individual and your community, but really to all of us overall. So those are some of the reasons I Mm -hmm. think it's really Mm -hmm. beneficial for our woodland owners to get educated um, about their property, what they have on their property, and what they can do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, It is a asset. It it really is. And it needs to be treated as an asset. And um, I'm really appreciative to all of our woodland owners for all they do for us in forestry, but also for society overall. 
Well, you mentioned impacts. What kind of impacts? Like water? Or what kind of impacts uh, for them actually doing something on their property? Is it helping? Uh, sure. Um, well, specifically, yeah, water is a big mm -hmm. one. If you think about a, a great example is Berea College, right? Mm -hmm. Berea College in Madison County, they have a large block of forest land. And really, that block of forest land is the source of most of the drinking water in that in that community right mm -hmm. there. So that's an example of how those forests help cut down treatment costs, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're really purifying that water before right. it gets there. And I was just down at the Berea College water treatment facility, and they were talking about how Limited the inputs they have to do there because the water coming off is so clean. Hmm. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's just, good to hear. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great example of what our forest can do from that standpoint. Um, other benefits, right? Maybe if you're interested in wildlife, mm -hmm. you, there are certain practices that we can do that will attract the wildlife species that you may be interested in, and so that could be a direct impact to you, but also to the surrounding region mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, just a couple examples. Right. Okay. So you mentioned Kentucky is forested. How much of Kentucky is? Right. Forested, <laughs> uh, right at forty nine percent. Almost know? half. I know. I'm like, all right. One more percent. Uh, how many? If you got some clear land, plant some more trees so we can get over fifty percent, please. Yes. Right. No. Um, uh, but about half the state of Kentucky is covered in forest land, and mm -hmm. it, and again, so often, in my opinion, it goes unrecognized for its importance and its value. Um, we talk about um, economics sometimes. If you want to think about economics, the forest industry in Kentucky is huge. It's mm -hmm. over thirteen billion dollars annually. It contributes. That is big to Kentucky's economy. We have more than 26,000 people directly employed in the forest industry in Kentucky, and really almost 60,000, if you kind of extend that out indirectly and induced, are supported by the forest industry in Kentucky. And it's almost in about 113 counties. Mm -hmm. um, we have some type of forest industry of our 120. So it's really distributed across the state, and it contributes all the way across the state too. So it's really an important resource. And again, most of that land is privately owned. So it's what these landowners, these private woodland owners do with their property has big implications, not only on them individually, but all of us, really, mm -hmm. and certainly on the forest industry here in Kentucky. Yeah, and that's why we try to offer these, just so to help landowners to, right. to know what to do. We offer this webinars and also classes on different things, so yeah. um, hopefully throughout the year they'll have different offerings to be able to figure out what they might be interested in. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. well, and I'd be glad to come back and tell about some future programs we're I working. I have no doubt yeah. we'll have you back yeah. on. <laughs> We've got a, our Woodland Owner Short courses in the planning stages right yeah, now, right. but I should be able to have some details for your listeners real soon and this is a great program that will be available for woodland owners to come and spend the day with us um, across the across Kentucky we're going to have one in um, east central and west Kentucky and it's a, on a Saturday so you can that's come, this you, summer that's just right. coming up this summer mm -hmm. and I'll tell you a little bit more about that once we got some of the right. details resolved but again I encourage you with your listeners out there please join us this Thursday at a local county extension office that's hosting this um, webinar it's a great opportunity to learn a lot in a short period of time and make some great connections that really might have a lasting impact not only on your forestry property but your life overall so those two hours may last you a lifetime yes, yes, so. <laughs> all right well thank you billy for coming in we greatly appreciate it well i'm delighted to be here and i appreciate all you all are doing to try to promote good forestry and wildlife management in kentucky um, from the woods kentucky's a great show and you all are doing a great job with it thank, thank you. you stay tuned for wildlife sounds from the forest Welcome back to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Matt Springer, Assistant Extension Wildlife Professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Before I tell you what that sound was you heard at the beginning of the show, let's play it again for you. All right, Matt, so what was that sound? So that sound was a very angry possum. Possum. Yes, okay. he's putting on a show. Obviously, when they are playing dead, mm -hmm. which they do, they don't make any, any noises, but they will, will make some growling and hissing noises as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it's our only marsupial in North, mm -hmm. in North America, in, mm -hmm. in Kentucky. Um, there's several different species the further south you go into Latin America and Central America uh, and into South America, um, but we really have the Virginia possum. Okay, so where does the playing possum statement come from? The playing possum statement comes from the fact that that's one of their strategies to avoid predators, is to play dead. And what they'll do is they will open their mouth and go rigid like they're completely dead in hopes that whatever 
predator is chasing them will mm-hmm. lose interest when they find out that it's not actually alive. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes predators won't eat already dead things. Oh, okay. um, they won't scavenge. I was going to say, it just uh, seems like it make it easy for right. them, yeah, but right. maybe not. No, or yes. it's, it's a, a, I'm going to lull you to sleep and then run away as fast as I can. Mm. If I get the chance, mm-hmm. um, but they will, they will do that. And I mean, they will have their mouth open. You can poke them and pick them up and they'll stay rigid as can be. Not that I recommend you doing that. Right. <laughs> do they bite? They can bite. They and can they actually, bite. they have the most teeth out of any of animal species mm-hmm. at 50. 50 teeth. They have 50 teeth. Wow. That is a very unique identifier. So if you ever find a skull and count the teeth mm-hmm. and you get the 50, there's nothing else it could be. Hmm. Um, okay. so they are, they're kind of, um, the other thing is they have a sagittal crest, which is a bone, um, uh, on top of their head mm-hmm. that sticks up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's the other unique feature when you find a skull and they're one of the more common skulls people will find as they walk around because we have quite a few possums mm-hmm. and they don't live long. Oh, how long do they live? If they make it to a year, they're doing great. Oh, really? If they make it to two, it's amazing. It's because they're slow. Mm-hmm. and don't react quickly. And then they play dead for their predator strategy. <laughs> right? so, yes. yeah. so where do they live? Uh, so they will take advantage of uh, a lot of different areas. I know they live in um, Lexington. I so see them quite pretty, often. Pretty much anywhere <laughs> but the water. Um, yeah, so you'll see them quite a bit in Lexington and um, urban areas in general. And then they'll also be in the middle of the woods. Um, they're uh, basically omnivores that will eat almost anything they can get in their mouth. Mm-hmm. So from, you know, your uh, Cheetos to <laughs> the apples in the trees and corn on the ground if you're in the urban, you know, or the, the agricultural environment. Mm-hmm. So it's a wide range, insects, you name it. Mm-hmm. Will they try to get in garbage cans Absolutely. and things like that? Absolutely, 100%. Mm-hmm. They're, um, they have pretty good use of their fingers. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very good climbers. Mm-hmm. They have their tail that allows them to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, so they can get around pretty well, not fast Mm -hmm. per se, but they can get around pretty well. Are there different colors of possums? So they'll range from a dark black, uh, not completely like a darker gray, dark, Mm -hmm. um, to uh, almost white. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's natural variation in in the color. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it kind of depends on the individual, um, you know, there's some neater patterns when you get into, there's, there's many possum species and there's some neater looking ones, mm-hmm. uh, especially in South America. Okay. So what a full size possum, what size would that Up be? Up to about 13 pounds. Oh, Yeah. Wow. They can get fairly chunky, <laughs> uh, especially those that have a big trash can to get into. <laughs> um, so they, they will get pretty large and, um, they, they are a fast producing species. They can have up to three litters a year. And that's relating to the fact that they get eaten a lot. There's mm-hmm. a lot of predators. Um, they get hit by cars a lot now. Um, and they can have up up to 12 um, babies at once. Three um, times a year? Uh, three times a year. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's more of a gradient from north to south. So the further south you go, the mm-hmm. more litters they can have because of the climate. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not just in Kentucky. That's in general. Right. Um, and their babies are actually born at 12 to 13 days. And they climb out, uh, they climb up the, the mother's stomach into the pouch, mm-hmm. and then they'll spend about two months in the pouch. It's until like they, a kangaroo. It is, mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, well, somewhat. With the pouch. Yes, so yes, yeah. <laughs> um, they'll spend about two months in the pouch, just attached to uh, mammary glands, mm-hmm. getting bigger. And about, you know, two, 60 to 70 days, they'll start popping out for short periods of time. Mm-hmm. And about two and a half months to three months, they start riding on mom's back. And they look adorable, right? It's probably mm-hmm. about the only time people will say a possum looks adorable. Possum's cute, yeah. <laughs> um, and then about three and a half months, they'll start venturing on their own, and shortly thereafter, leave and go on their own. Okay, so when it gets cold, do they? Leave they don't or? do well with cold. Okay. Their fur is one of the thinner furs out of our meso carnivore species, like raccoons. They mm-hmm. they don't do well with cold. Their mm-hmm. fur isn't that thick. Um, so they rely heavily on their dens. Mm-hmm. So they're mostly nocturnal. Um, it's not unusual to see them in the day and they don't, they have super, super, it's almost impossible for them to get rabies Mm because of their body temperature, Mm -hmm. but they rely heavily on that den and being able to, to get a lot of materials in there to insulate them versus, you know, themselves just curling up in a ball, like say a squirrel or a raccoon. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're very much underrated for how useful they are. They eat almost over 4,000 ticks a year. So they're kind of our tick defense. Um, Any more of them then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, you know, they really don't carry diseases. Uh, the only one, they have a one parasite that could cause some problems for horses is one of the biggest things. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, there really isn't a lot of concern that you can get bit by them. So don't go playing with them. They have right. those teeth. 
Um, but other than that, if you can stand having them around, they're really great to have around. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you said they made these, they make these dens. So what do they stuff the dens with to make them warmer? Leaves, anything they can find? And, yeah, anything they can find. I mean, they can get in your attics oh. and get in that insulation, which is probably <laughs> the best bet for them, but right. uh, not so much for us. <laughs> uh, but mostly leaves uh, is a big one or um, any kind of grasses, anything they can get that would um, take up space and provide that buffer from the, the thermal um, mm-hmm. outside. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for coming in yeah. today. We appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. And we have a new show schedule for spring 2019. You can listen to us live on WRFL 88.1 FM on Mondays from 11 a.m. to noon. And if you miss the Monday shows, you can listen to our podcasts on our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.